Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. Vince Lombardi was a great football coach with the Green Bay Packers, and he made this famous statement. You've probably heard of it. Fatigue makes cowards out of us all. When you are at a point of fatigue, up at the scrake of dawn, going to bed with the owls at night, that's not a good pattern. We can't keep living like that, or else we'll break and we'll bend just like Elijah. There are days when we wake up and the world just seems to be going right. The sun is shining, the birds are singing, and we're ready for the day. Of course, we all experience gloomy days as well when we dread the very idea of getting out of bed. Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy shares practical encouragement for when we're feeling down in the dumps. We're drawing from the example of the prophet Elijah in a study Philip calls Down But Not Out. Let's get started with today's message. Here's Philip DeCourcy. God's servants are not impervious to discouragement, disappointment, and depression. Depression is the common cold of the emotions, and none of us are immune from its attack or its advance, from its grip. And that's why we want to just slow down and take our time as we exposit 1 Kings 19, because here we have a classic example of this depression and despair in the life of Elijah, the man of God and the prophet of Israel. Chapter 19 begins with uh, Elijah taking to the road, panic-stricken, running from Jezreel, getting as far away from Jezebel as he could. After her threat to take his life, he is seized with a panic attack, and uh, suddenly and inexplicably, um, he runs for his life according to verse 3. And the text moves all of a sudden from success to suicide. Because here we have the prophet of God uh, at the tail end of chapter 18 enjoying a great victory over the enemies of God. And, And before we know it, we're sitting down with him under a broom tree where he's asking God to take his life. Now we've got to step back a little and just see him sitting there under the broom tree and ask ourselves a very profound question. How could such a man come to such a moment over such a matter? Well, I've come up with five factors and I'll try and make some applications along the way, but, but mark these, because these, these factors will be operative in your life. And if you're not careful and you're not watchful, you, you will open the door of your life to the dark visitor of depression. The first factor is what I call his frustration. His frustration. I think there's some self-pity here, but whether failure is real or imagined, It's real, in some sense, to the person who feels that they have failed. He seems to have fallen short of his desired goals, and I think that's related to the fact that he must have expected Jezebel to just stand aside and let the Reformation come to full bloom, but she didn't. He expected her to put her hands up in surrender. He was seized with the sense of failure. And you need to learn to deal with disappointment because people and problems will frustrate us. And if we do not plan and prepare for disappointment, we become vulnerable to depression. We live in a futile and vain world which very rarely cooperates with us. Often God's sovereignty and providence is rather mysterious and victories are never complete. And you and I need to lay hold of those realities or else a sense of failure and a sense of frustration will strangle the life out of us. Elijah not only dealt with frustration, we see secondly his faithlessness. Up until this moment, have you noticed that whenever Elijah acted, he acted in faith in response to the revealed and compelling word of God? Go back to chapter 17, verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. 
Look at chapter 17, verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Look at chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. So God said, Hey, Elijah, go to Sherath. Elijah, leave Cherith and go to Seraphath. Elijah, leave Seraphath and go to Mount Carmel and present yourself to Ahab. And here we have in chapter 19, Elijah is in Jezreel and he heads 90 miles south to Beersheba, but God didn't tell him to do it. He's become faithless. Driven by fear, he, he becomes faithless and reacts impulsively apart from God's revealed plan. Instead of waiting to hear from God, he took counsel from his fears and feelings, and he fled. That's factor number two. He was seized with a sense of failure, which, as we'll see, was greatly exaggerated. But here he is is stampeded by fear to run without a word from God. He gets his eyes off the Lord and onto his circumstances, and before long, his feelings have overtaken his faith, and he loses his footing. And he becomes a victim to depression. Here's the third thing. You not only have his frustration, you not only have his faithlessness, you have his fatigue. As you look into the sad and sullen face of Elijah, there's little doubt that exhaustion played a big part in his melancholic mood. Look at verse um, 5. As soon as he kind of expresses his frustration and his, his fear and a sense of failure to the Lord, we read in verse 5, Then he lay down and slept. The guy just kind of keeled over. He was so exhausted. And we read in the text that the angel comes and touches him and tells him to waken up, but there's food set at his head, and he eats it, and there's a jar of water, which he drinks. And what do we read? He ate, and he drank, and he lay down again, back to sleep. The guy is just out of it, physically speaking. He's exhausted. He's wiped out. And no wonder there was the thrill and there was the tension of Mount Carmel. Then there was the letdown of Jezebel's intransigence. And then there was the 90-mile journey to the borders of Israel. And then a further hike into the desert. His fuel gauge was on empty. And this was a problem. This contributed to his depression of spirit. He opened himself up to this um, slide down into the dumps. Because he, like us, dismissed and discounted the effects of the body on the spirit. What does the Bible say in Matthew 26, verse 41? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Listen to me. Our bodies and our souls tend to live in such close proximity that they each catch the other's diseases. And so we need to just simply recognize that a part of Elijah's problem was nothing more than natural weariness. Our bodies can only take so much. Physical depletion opens the door to the dark visitor of despair. I want you to hear these words from David Roper. They're very, very helpful. Sometimes our dark moods are nothing more than physical and emotional depletion. Like Elijah, we've been running scared, overdoing everything, committing ourselves to more projects and plans than anyone could ever do. We try to be all things to all people all of the time. We string ourselves out, spending all of our time and energy, adding to God's will, our will, trying to do everything extremely well. We over-adrenalize our bodies, giving them no chance to recover. We give ourselves them no margins in which to adjust to unexpected emergencies. Overworked and underslept, we finally reach a yield point and we fold. Our bodies can't take it anymore. Unlike that battery-powered bunny, we just can't keep going. We'll see the importance of the physical in terms of Elijah's recovery the next time we look at this tax. But just mark it down. When you are at a point of fatigue, perhaps you've, you know, gone through a round of, of uh, engagements 
or appointments or things you have to do. And so for weeks, you know what? There really hasn't been a lot of downtime. Your sleep has been broken. You're up at the scrake of dawn. You're going to bed with the owls at night. That's not a good pattern. Sometimes that's the way life is. But you and I need to be aware of that. And we need to make sure that we allow our bodies to rebound. We can't keep living like that. Or else we'll break and we'll bend just like Elijah. Vince Lombardi was a great football coach with the Green Bay Packers. He was a great coach, not just because he understood football, but because he understood people. And he made this famous statement. You've probably heard it, but I'll remind you of it. Fatigue makes cowards out of us all. That's why I promised myself never to resign from the ministry on a Monday. Because I can be sure it's a mistake. I can be sure it's a mistake. Exhaustion and fatigue make cowards out of us all. There's a fourth factor. His forlornness or his isolation. Elijah's burnout was due to the fact that he cut himself off from others who could have been a source of oxygen, encouragement. You look at verse um, 3. And when he saw that, when he saw that Jezebel wasn't about to turn... He arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And look, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, which we guesstimate may have been anything around about 14 miles. Elijah cuts himself off from the oxygen of encouragement that one receives from the company of others. In fact, some commentators suggest we have no um, grounds to be sure about this, that the servant was the widow's son that uh, Elijah had been brought back to life by God's grace. And we can't be sure about that, but if you were to imagine that was to be the case, you, here's this servant of God when the clouds are gathering and the sun's being blotted out and he doesn't feel that his ministry has really taken hold and, and instead of revival, he has been faced with resistance. It would have been nice to be able just to look across and see the boy sitting there and, and remind yourself how God's power had been demonstrated through your ministry in the life of this boy. But whether that was the case or not, Elijah foolishly isolated himself from strengthening relationships. Genesis 2 verse 18. Everybody that's disappointed, everybody that's dealing with the difficulty needs this verse. It is not good for man to be alone. It's not good to be alone. Especially when, when you're discouraged You need others speaking into your life. That's why Jesus sent out his disciples, what? Two by two. He didn't send them out by themselves, Luke 10, verse 1. That's why the apostles worked in teams. Initially, you had Paul and Barnabas. Then you had that rift between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. And then the book of Acts tells us we end up with Paul and Silas, Barnabas and John Mark. Throughout his letters, Paul loved to use the Greek prefix sen, which means with or co. And he was always talking about his co-laborers and his co-slaves and his co-soldiers and his co-prisoners. Paul was rarely alone. In fact, the only time we really find Paul alone was when Corinth, and he almost lost it until Titus comes. Left to one man, the ministry will not leave much of the man. And so everybody, especially God's servants, need a company of friends and prayer warriors and those who will come alongside to encourage because it's a dangerous thing for any one of us to cut ourselves off from people. We need their accountability. We need their love. And depression, depression loves to feed on loneliness and isolation. A study at John Hopkins University examining the health records of 1,300 medical students over a period of 18 years revealed that the strongest pronosticator for cancer, mental illness, and suicide was a lack of intimacy with family. Another study of 7,000 people in Alameda, California, revealed that people with few close contacts tended to die two to three times sooner than those who saw their friends regularly a figure that held up even after adjustments were made for smoking, poor health histories, and other negative factors. 
we need others, folks. And we need each other. Because depression loves to feed on isolation and loneliness. Let me uh, finish with the last thought. His frustration, his faithlessness, his fatigue, his forlornness, and finally his forgetfulness. I think this is an interesting factor that you and I need to watch out for, another tendency that we need to track in each of our lives. Elijah became very forgetful. In fact, he became very selective in how he remembered things. This will take us to verse 10. Okay? He runs like a scared rabbit about 114 miles from Jezreel to this broom tree somewhere out in the wilderness beyond the borders of Israel, beyond Beersheba. He falls asleep. God lets him sleep for a little bit of time. Then he wakens him up, gives him some food and drink, and lets him go back to sleep again. And then he encourages him to get up and make a journey which brings him to Mount Horeb, which we'll look at in another sermon. But but I want you to notice verse 10. So so here he is in this cave, which which the caves that honeycomb Mount Horeb, and and the word of the Lord comes to him and says, Hey, Elijah, what are you doing here? Now look at verse 10, and, and we'll pick the words apart just for a few moments, and you'll see how selective... Um, Elijah is. He, he paints the picture with one eye closed. Depressed people do this. And people who are slipping in depression do this. They only see what they want to see. They focus on the negative. Elijah allowed wrong thinking to bring everything uh, to a point that it was out of perspective and out of proportion. Look at what he says in verse 10. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, That's true. For the children of God have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Well, let's just pick that apart a little. We've we've just enjoyed Mount Carmel. The people of God have repented. They're no longer halting between two opinions. They've made a decision. They've said the Lord is God. And in fact, the altars that had been torn down had been rebuilt. Remember, Elijah rebuilt the altar of the Lord? He tells us that um, he alone is left. That's not true. You remember his incident with Obadiah, where he was told that Obadiah had been keeping a hundred of God's prophets, 50 to a cave? The Lord's going to tell him here in a few moments, no, Elijah, there's 7,000 haven't bowed the knee. And then finally, look at what he says, and they seek to take my life. Who's the they? It's one woman. You see how exaggerated his language is? He's very selective in his memory. Why? Because remember, he's run ahead of God. He's lost his focus. He's no longer centered upon God and his word. He's now taking counsel from his fears, from his feelings. He's absolutely exhausted. No wonder this guy's in the mess that he's in. He's frustrated, he's fatigued, he's faithless, and now he's being forgetful. Elijah's perspective was distorted. He was no longer thinking of things that were true and of a good report, and therefore he no longer enjoyed or experienced the guardianship of God's peace. You see, he let his mind run away with itself. And if you allow that to happen, before long your feet will follow in a panic attack. That's why Isaiah 26 verse 3 says what? I will keep him in perfect peace. I will keep her in perfect peace if they'll just focus their minds on me and settle their trust with me. The depressed mind operates out of a selective memory. Vance Havner, who I love to read and quote, said this, you cannot be optimistic with a misty optic. You get his point? You can't be optimistic with a misty optic if you're clouded in your vision and your focus. There's no way you're going to see things from God's perspective. And this is what was happening in Elijah's life. The prophet was looking through the wrong end of the telescope. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stead upon you, whose heart trusts in you. And poor old Elijah just lost his focus. We're all capable of that. 
We're really just diagnosing his problem. We haven't written a prescription yet. But nevertheless, just learning the causes is helpful in itself. Let me just repeat them and we'll be done. Watch out for those times in your life when you become disappointed with something or someone. And that's going to happen, isn't it? There's no way you can get through life unscathed. People will disappoint you. Some of your goals will never be reached. Some of your dreams will never materialize. But you don't have to fall apart because of that. Ask God to teach you how to deal with disappointment. And the best thing is just to go to him because he's never a disappointment. So watch out for frustration. And then we saw his, his faithlessness. He runs in a panic. He doesn't wait upon the Lord. He takes counsel from his feelings and not from the Spirit of God. That's a dangerous thing to do. Excessive speed in life leads to collisions and emotional fender benders. Sometimes life just gets busy, doesn't it? There's no escaping that. But if they do, make sure you've got some breathing hole somewhere. Make sure you take a day off. Make sure you go walk in the woods. Make sure you get a drive out to the lake and just clear your head and clear your thoughts and give your body a moment to rebound because we are but dust. God knows that. I think sometimes we forget that. And sometimes our depression is simply sourced in natural and physical weariness, nothing more. Sometimes we can make it too profound and too spiritual. And then we saw that he cut himself off. Have you got a close friend? Is there somebody that knows your heart? Is there somebody that knows your worst fears, your besetting sins? Is there somebody you can go and talk to? Your spouse should be that if you're married. If you're single, you should have a friend you can go to. Pastors and shepherds in the church ought to be that. Because it's not good that we ever find ourselves alone by ourselves and with our fears. That's dangerous. And then this last thought is challenging, isn't it? You lose your focus and and the sky's always falling. And you exaggerate the problem. And you minimize God. And you run around that fear and that anxiety so much that you become so disoriented that you fall into the arms of depression. Some practical ways to guard against depression in our lives. You're listening to Philip DeCourcy here on Know the Truth. Today's message is titled Down in the Dumps, and it's part of a larger series on surviving seasons of discouragement called Down But Not Out. If you're facing a stormy sea today, whether it's personal, relational, or whatever the case may be, Philip has a book he highly recommends to help you find biblical courage and peace. It's written by a colleague in pastoral ministry, Robert Jeffress. The title of the book is Courageous, Ten Strategies for Thriving in a Hostile World. When times are tough and we can feel the punishing blows from those who don't share our Christian values, it's easy to slip into survival mode just trying to keep standing. But the life God has called us to live is so much more. We want you to read this new and relevant book. Again, it's called Courageous, Ten Strategies for Thriving in a Hostile World. And it's yours when you give a generous gift to support the ministry of Know the Truth. Just mention the one word, Courageous, when you call 888-644-8811 or visit ktt.org. And thank you for your support. Every dollar you give goes directly to continuing our mission to proclaim God's Word with boldness and conviction. Thanks to support from listeners like you, we've been able to make Philip's teaching available on the radio as well as the KTT mobile app, podcasting apps, and our website. If you know someone who would benefit from Philip's teaching, we encourage you to share all of these free listening options. You can learn more at ktt.org. I'm Wayne Shepherd for Philip DeCourcy, inviting you to join us Wednesday as we continue our study of the prophet Elijah right here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.